be a great help. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 2. Let's talk about why did God become a man. Reading in verse 5. It says, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we're speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified what is man that you are mindful of him. The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of one family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Jumping down to verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants." For this reason, he had to be made like them in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help us when we are being tempted. Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to help us this morning. Now, uh, two things I have to share with you. I'm, I feel great today. I'm just getting over a little cold uh, that one of my children brought in the house. So I feel just fine. But uh, if I get a little croaky at some point, just keep, keep amening in spite of the croaking. All right. That's number one. Number two, we're running late today and it is everybody else's fault but the preacher. OK, so I just want you to know that we might go a little long today, but you just trust Jesus. We're going to be OK. All right. We're going to make it through. And I have a good word to share with you. Come on, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and your powerful word. Father, I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen? If God is who we say he is, why is there so much suffering in the world? If God is loving and merciful, if God is infinitely just, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere present, why is the world the way that it is? Why does God allow natural disasters to wipe out tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people at a time? Started receiving distress messages two days ago from many friends that we have in Chennai, India. There's terrible flooding going on there. People have been wiped out and people are in tremendous need. And I started getting messages from students that we've taught over the years over in Asia asking for our help. Why does God allow epidemics of disease? Why does he allow birth defects? Why does he allow parents to suffer the death of their children and children to suffer the death of their parents? Why does God allow brutal dictators to rise to power? Why does he allow war and refugee crises? Why does he allow slavery and human trafficking? Why does God allow crime? If God is who we say he is, why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he act? Why doesn't he intervene? That question is behind the despicably anti-Christian headline that appeared in the New York Daily News on Thursday morning 
after the San Bernardino massacre that called prayer a meaningless platitude. God isn't fixing this. No, we can do a much better job ourselves without his help. Yeah, you let me know how that's working out for you. We see how that's working out for you. Nevertheless, it remains true that suffering in the world is the greatest challenge to our testimony of a God who is both good and almighty. Even the heroes in the Bible grappled with that problem. Hebrews chapter 2 takes up that same conundrum. In verses 6 through 8 that we read, there's a quotation from Psalm 8 that shows God's original intention for mankind. God's original intention for mankind was glory and honor, not the shameful behavior that we see today. God's original content, uh, intent was for mankind to be in firm control of all creation and of human society. That's actually a real picture. That's a guy from South Africa named Kevin Richardson. He is an animal trainer. We're going to be able to do that in the millennial kingdom, but don't try it now, okay? The original intent was for mankind to keep evil subjugated under his feet. God's original intent was order. God's original intent was harmony. God's original intent was peace and security and abundance and for man to flourish in every way that man can. But Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that is not what we presently see. Verse 9, yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. And then Hebrews chapter 2 tells us the solution to the problem of suffering. And that is to look at Jesus. At present we do not see everything subject to him But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Beloved, the solution to the conundrum of suffering is found in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The solution is to look at his humanity to the one who asks Why doesn't God do something about suffering? Hebrews chapter 2 answers roundly, he already has. He has already done the most loving and the most effective thing that he could ever do. In the 11th century, St. Anselm of Canterbury asked the question, why did God become a man? That's a question so big that it's answered several different ways in the words of Jesus and in the New Testament. For the next few weekends during this Christmas season, I want us to explore this question together. Why did God become a man? And my prayer is that your heart will overflow with awe and with adoration and with gratitude and with faith as we look at the most fundamental truth of our Christian faith The doctrine of the incarnation. Why did God become a man? Starting out in Hebrews chapter 2, God became a man to cry with us. How on earth does the incarnation speak to this conundrum of suffering? How does it vindicate God's character? Looking at Hebrews chapter 2, I find three things that I want to share with you quickly. And if you're visiting today, quickly is relative, all right? I just want to warn you about that. But it's not my fault that we're running over time today. It is my fault, but you love me anyway, right? (laughs) How does the incarnation speak to the conundrum of suffering? Three truths. First of all, the incarnation means that God himself has suffered with us. From the fourth grade through high school graduation, I had the privilege of attending a Christian school. It was a very strict Christian school, very rigid. Part of our curriculum was Bible class, and we had to memorize large 
quantities of scripture. In my sophomore year, we memorized the whole epistle of James in the old King James English. By our senior year, we were asked to select a Bible verse that would serve as a life verse that would sort of guide us through our journey into adulthood. The scripture reference for our life verse appeared under our photo, our senior photo in the yearbook. I was in the distinguished, distinguished class of 1985, but in the class of 1984, there was a little trouble. Several of the boys conspired together to list as their life verse, John 11.35. Does anybody here know John 11.35? Do you know it, Miss Lila? John 11.35? Yeah, John 11.35 has the distinction of being the shortest verse in the entire Bible. It is two words, Jesus wept. Now it turns out that the boys in the class of 1984 didn't really care that Jesus wept. They were just making a little jab at all the years of memorizing passages of scripture in King James English. We in the class of 1985 thought it was hysterical. The administration, not so much. And after all those boys got a three-day suspension, they wept. <laughs> but in spite of its brevity, I want to tell you that John 11.35 is a profoundly important verse. God, infinite and eternal. God, the creator of heaven and earth. God, who is an all-consuming fire. God, who lives in unapproachable light. <clears throat> Even the angels that surround his throne and shout, holy, 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 have to cover their eyes because they're not permitted to look on him. This God wept human tears. That is a Staggering truth. The doctrine of the incarnation is the truth that at a precise moment in history, God became one of us. God became a man, the man, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 is about the absolute deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus was and is 100% God. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Hebrews chapter 2 is about the absolute humanity of Jesus Christ. Jesus also was and is 100% human. Chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. Chapter 2, verse 11, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of one stock, of one race, of one family. Chapter 2, in verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity. Chapter 2, verse 17, for this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way. You know, it's that last line that we have the hardest time wrapping our minds around. He was made like us in every way. How is it possible that God could remain God and at the same time become fully human? How could God come to dwell within the confines of time and space and still be eternal? How could the creator become a creature in the world that he himself created and still remain the sustainer of all things? How could God become what he previously was not and yet remain what he always was? Indeed, St. Paul calls it a great mystery. It's in that category of things the Bible calls too wonderful for us. For those who have grown up with the Christmas story, and I would suspect that's most of us, the idea that God appeared in a human body 
is familiar to us, but Hebrews is saying something a little more than that. He was made like us in every way. That means that Jesus didn't only have a human body, he also had a human mind and human emotions and a human will and a human nature. Jesus was not merely God in the appearance of a man. Jesus was and he forever is the one and only God man. We struggle to think about Jesus being like us in every way. Because he was and is God, we think of life on earth as being much easier for him than it was for us. But I want to tell you that lying there as a baby, Jesus was really just as helpless as were we. Although he still possessed all the powers of omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence, when he entered Mary's womb, he submitted the exercise of those things to the will of the Father. Jesus didn't have an awareness of his identity as God until the Father willed him to know it at some point before his ministry. Jesus didn't have an awareness of his manner of death on the cross until the point that his Father willed for him to know it. And in the meantime, Jesus passed through every kind of human experience and trial just as much a human as are we. And here's the point with regard to suffering. Jesus didn't come and just observe our human suffering from a closer vantage point. Jesus actually entered into our suffering and he suffered alongside of us. A few years ago, we were privileged to partner with several other ministries to do a water project in the Rift Valley in Kenya. One ministry built a water conduit from Lake Naivasha to the center of the Rift Valley. Another ministry, actually it was T.D. Jakes, built a huge cistern to hold the water. Another ministry built a network of pipes that carried the water up a ridge and for miles down that ridge so that the water could gravity feed down into the valley at various points. And harvest time built the pumping station that made the water flow through all the pipes. While we were there building that pumping station, Maasai girls kept arriving at the cistern carrying buckets on their heads. They walked a whole day in the hot sun to reach the cistern. It was too far for them to walk home before nightfall, so they slept on the ground beside the cistern wrapped up in their red blankets. They had no protection from the elements they had no protection from wild animals. They had no protection from the men that were there watering their cattle. In the morning, they filled their buckets. They hoisted them on their heads and they walked home again all day in the hot sun. That was a trip that those girls made two times every week. I wept when I saw up close how hard life is for them. But then again, I had a backpack with me with several big bottles of clean drinking water that I had brought from the hotel. In the late afternoon, I got on a coach bus and I rode back to Nairobi where there was a hot shower and a hot supper waiting for me. I slept in an air-conditioned, mosquito-free hotel room with a deadbolt lock on the door and security guards in the hallway. It's one thing to see suffering up close, but it is quite another thing to suffer oneself. I have never carried a bucket of water on my head. I've never walked for hours barefoot in the desert sun. I have never slept out under the stars, afraid of men and afraid of wild animals. And you see, this is the thing about Jesus' incarnation. Jesus didn't show up on earth like an American making day trips into the Rift Valley. Jesus didn't merely observe suffering up close. Jesus actually walked barefoot across the desert floor in the desert sun. 
Jesus carried water on his head, as it were. He slept out under the stars. He faced the despair of having to do it again and again, week after week, week in and week out. <clears throat> Beloved, no one can ever lay the charge that God is indifferent to our suffering. God didn't just come close to study our suffering. He entered into our suffering. That's good preaching right there. From the cradle to the grave, Jesus suffered in many ways that humans do. Jesus was an unplanned pregnancy to an underprivileged teenage girl. His paternity was uncertain. That was a stain that would follow him for the rest of his life. That's why he was called Jesus of Nazareth and not Jesus bar Joseph, Jesus son of Joseph. Jesus was adopted by his stepfather. He didn't have a relationship with an earthly biological father. Jesus was born into poverty in deplorable conditions. Jesus was born under the oppressive regime of a brutal dictator. He was deemed a political enemy as a baby, and he was the target of an assassination attempt through genocide. That would be the first of many attempts on his life. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus was a refugee child. I'll tell you what, when the Holy Spirit reminded me of that one, I had a little repenting to do. Jesus was a refugee child. Jesus was raised in a backwater town with few opportunities. He received a modest education. He was a manual laborer. He lost his adoptive father early in life and as a young adult was left with the responsibility of caring for his widowed mother. He was ridiculed by his half-siblings. He was an embarrassment even to his mom. His family tried to kidnap him at one point for an intervention. He was rejected by the people of his own hometown. He was the object of harsh criticism. He was called an instigator, a blasphemer. He was called insane. He was called demon-possessed. He received death threats, and he evaded new, numerous attempted assaults. Jesus was homeless at times. He was hungry at times. He was thirsty at times. He was weary at times. He was overwhelmed by the demands of work at times. He was dependent on the hospitality and the generosity of strangers. He had tax bills for which he did not have the money to pay, but somehow he always paid on time. Jesus experienced the death of family members and close friends and he experienced real grief and he cried real human tears. Jesus wept. He was single. He never married. He was betrayed by a close friend and abandoned by the rest of his friends at his greatest hour of need. He was handed over to the cruel Romans by his own countrymen. He was falsely accused. He was improperly tried. He was falsely testified against. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. And then Jesus was crucified. A form of execution devised by the Babylonians to inflict maximum human suffering. Jesus suffered in many ways that humans do. But because he was Messiah... He also suffered in some unique ways, too. Jesus experienced spiritual warfare and direct personal attacks from the devil more than any other human who has ever lived. After the temptation in the wilderness, Luke says that Satan withdrew from Jesus until the next opportunity. Because Jesus never succumbed to temptation, because he never sinned, he suffered from an ever-increasing intensity of temptation. The more Jesus refused to yield, the greater the weight upon him. But what does it mean that God suffered with us? How does it speak to the problem of suffering? How does one more suffering human being on earth, a God-man no less, how does that help us? Doesn't that just add to the tally of suffering in the world? Well, Hebrews says that Jesus' suffering was absolutely necessary 
to prepare him for his role as our great high priest. Chapter 2 in verse 10, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Chapter 2, verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and trustworthy high priest. Because he himself suffered, he is able to help those who are suffering. Beloved, listen to me. The suffering of Jesus did not merely add to the tally of misery in the world. The suffering of Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Jesus' suffering made him the perfect candidate to be our high priest. When verse 10 says that Jesus was made perfect through suffering, it doesn't mean that he was in some way imperfect. Suffering did not remove something impure from Jesus. Suffering did not add something good to Jesus that he was lacking. That word, listen Bible students, that word he was made perfect through suffering. It's the same word in the Old Testament for the process by which priests were consecrated and by which they were approved for service. Jesus, the already perfect God-man, became the perfect approved candidate to be our high priest through his suffering with us. Down in verse 17, we're told specifically what qualities suffering has etched on his heart. The qualities of mercy and of trustworthiness. You see, because Jesus suffered, I can thankfully anticipate finding mercy from him when I am suffering and I am being tested. Beloved, listen, the incarnation is the truth that God not only became human flesh, but that God has remained human flesh forever. After Jesus was ascended, after he was raised from the dead, after he ascended to heaven, Jesus did not go back to what he was before the incarnation. Jesus ever lives in a body of glorified human flesh. He still bears in his body the wounds of Calvary on his hands and on his feet and in his side. In heaven, Jesus has a heart of glorified human flesh. And when my heart is in pain, his heart feels it. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tested in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So let us approach the throne of grace confident that we will receive mercy. Beloved, Jesus' suffering on earth means that there is mercy in heaven for me. When I feel like I can't take it anymore, when I feel like I'm not going to make it, when I feel like I want to throw in the towel, there is mercy in heaven for me. When suffering tempts me to doubt his goodness, when I ask God, where are you? There is mercy in heaven for me. When I'm wallowing in self-pity, when I'm questioning God, there is mercy in heaven for me. When a spark of temptation crosses my mind, And I entertain it and I fan it into flame when I succumb and I fall into sin. When I'm overtaken and I need deliverance, there is mercy in heaven for me. When I deserve judgment, I can anticipate finding mercy instead. Along with mercy, verse 17 says that suffering has made Jesus a completely trustworthy high priest. Your Bible might say a faithful high priest. The word is reliable, trustworthy. You see, Jesus didn't merely come to earth to observe our suffering up close. He actually became one of us and he remains one of us. And because he is, I can trust him implicitly to represent me before the Father. 
On the cross, Jesus interceded for us. He said, Father, forgive them. And now at the right hand of God, Jesus continues making intercession for us, saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Listen, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody whatsoever, but I have to tell you from the Bible, you do not need Mary. You do not need any other saint or any other angel to make intercession for you. You have a great high priest, Jesus, who is making intercession for you. You can trust that he will make intercession for you. He will not forget to make intercession for you. He will not slack off. He does not need to be reminded and he doesn't need any help. You can trust that his disposition towards you will not change. He is not going to change his mind and say, "Uh, you know what, Father, don't forgive them after all. You can trust that his prayers on your behalf are powerful and beneficial. Beloved, listen to me and hear me well. Prayer is never, ever a meaningless platitude and specifically not when it comes from our great high priest, Jesus. In his mercy and trustworthiness, Verse 18 says that Jesus not only intercedes for us in heaven, but he offers us real help on earth. Because he himself suffered when he was tested, he's able to help us when we are being tested. Anybody been tested this year? Chapter 4, verse 16 tells us explicitly that his mercy gives us grace to help us in our time of need. That grace means divine strength for me. It means divine encouragement. It means divine empowerment. It means divine equipping. His grace enables us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. How does the incarnation speak to the conundrum of suffering? Three truths. First, God himself suffered with us. And second, the incarnation means that God himself has suffered for us. He suffered in our place. Beloved, no one can ever rightly say that God is indifferent to suffering. Jesus Christ suffered more than any human being who has ever lived. In a way that I can't even explain to you, starting that night in the garden in Gethsemane, Jesus began to take upon himself all the suffering of all humanity of all time. You might say, okay, well, so Jesus suffered, but he still didn't go through the hell that I've been through. It's true, Jesus was never the, result, never the victim of a sexual assault. It's true, Jesus was never abused by his parents. He was never a battered spouse. He was never exploited. Jesus didn't go through the pain of a divorce or a custody battle. Jesus never buried his spouse. He never had a long-term illness or a disability. He never raised a child with a disability. Jesus died young. He didn't go through the frustration of aging. It's true. But on the cross... Jesus experienced in a very direct and personal way the pain of every one of us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He is a man of sorrow, familiar with our suffering. On the cross, I believe that Jesus experienced in a very personal way my pain on the weekend of my 16th birthday when my father abandoned our family. I believe in a very personal way Jesus experienced my sister's pain when she found my nephew's lifeless body lying on her family room sofa three weeks ago. And he experienced your pain in a very personal way too. No one ever can rightly say that God has failed to act to relieve human suffering. In fact, God has already done the most loving and valuable thing he could ever do. 
He took the worst of human suffering on himself in order to spare us from it. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. By the grace of God, he tasted death on behalf of everyone. Chapter 2 verse 11. By his death, he destroyed him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Chapter 2 verse 17. He made atonement for the sins of the people. On the cross, Jesus took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. On the cross, he paid in full the penalty for sins, the frothing cup of God's wrath that should have been poured out on us was poured out on him. Beloved, can I tell you that there is no suffering on earth that can compare with the eternal suffering of those who die in their sins apart from God. The worst human suffering doesn't occur on earth. It begins precisely when life on earth is over. And this is the suffering that Jesus endured on our behalf so that we can be spared from it. For those who receive Jesus, for those who believe in him, for those who entrust themselves to him, there is no more fear of death. There's no more dread of judgment, but only the anticipation of mercy and of glory. How does the incarnation speak to the conundrum of suffering? Three truths. God himself suffered with us. God has suffered for us. And finally, because of the incarnation, one day very soon, God will make an end to our suffering. Worship team, come help me if you would. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us it's true. Things on earth are not at all the way God intended them to be yet. At present, we do not see everything under him Yet. See, things are not the way they're supposed to be, but it's not going to stay that way for too much longer. In the incarnation, Jesus became the fulfillment of Psalm 8. Jesus became the first man to be crowned with glory and honor. Jesus became the first man to have evil subjected under his feet. And in so doing, Jesus pioneered a pathway to salvation for us all. In so doing, Jesus inaugurated an age to come. Can I tell you right now, angels assist God with the administration of affairs on earth and we are a little lower than them. But Jesus has put us on a pathway to a destination called glory. And in this dawning age, in this age that has been inaugurated by Jesus, it is not angels who rule and reign at his side, but it is us. And then God will make an end to all of our suffering. Have you read to the end of the book? Have you read to the end of Revelation? You know what it says at the very end? It says at the very end, and he shall wipe every tear from their eyes. <laughs> In just a moment, we're going to share for our final act of worship communion together. We're going to invite you to this table, but I want to leave you with this that hopefully we'll just put a little cherry on top for you. This is a picture of a man named George Harley, a medical missionary to Ganta, Liberia, Africa. George was a brilliant young doctor. He had degrees from Duke from Yale, from London University. Everyone was anticipating a, a brilliant career from him. So they were shocked in 1926 when he announced that he was going to Liberia as a missionary. 
The Firestone Rubber Company had huge operations in Liberia, and Harvey Firestone himself called George Harley and invited him to be the chief of staff at the company's hospital in the capital of Monrovia. But George and Winifred wanted to go to the interior. They wanted to go somewhere where people had no medical care and where they had no gospel witness. When they arrived in Ganta, George asked the Mono people to help him make three structures. The first was a home for he and his wife. The second was a medical clinic and the third was a chapel. News of the white doctor spread quickly through the whole region and sick people poured into the clinic. In his first year of practicing medicine, George Harley was seeing over 160 patients a day, seeing 10,000 patients a year. But while the mono people gladly received the medical care, they were not at all interested in the white man's God. For the first five years, George held church services every Sunday in that little chapel and not a single villager came. It was just he and his wife. Not a single person wanted to hear him talk about his God. It was through an incident of extreme suffering that a spiritual breakthrough finally came for the Mono people. Shortly after they arrived in Ganta, Winifred gave birth to a little son named Bobby. He was their pride and joy. They loved him more than life itself. One day when Bobby was five, George looked out the window of the clinic and he saw his son running towards him through a field and the boy fell down and he got up again and ran a little further and he fell down again and this time he didn't get up. George ran to his son and picked up his body burning with a tropical fever. He carried his little boy back to the clinic and he said, don't worry, your daddy knows what to do. Your daddy knows what to do. I'll make it better. George said he pulled out all the stops. He tried every treatment he knew, but the fever continued to rage worse and worse. And a few nights later, the little boy died. George went to the wood shop and he nailed together some boards to make a little coffin. He laid his only son in that box and he nailed the lid shut and he hoisted it on his shoulders and he started walking through the jungle towards a clearing where he could bury his son. As he passed by the edge of the village, an old man called out to him, hey, what are you doing there? Where are you going with that box? George said to him, my son has died. I'm going to bury him. The old man said, let me help you. The man took one end of the coffin and George took the other and together they carried it to the clearing. They dug a hole and they laid the box inside. They covered it up again. And after the boy was buried, George Harley lost it. He dropped on his knees and then he fell on his face in the dirt, sobbing uncontrollably, pounding the ground. When the old man saw the missionary crying, he got down on all fours. He got up close to George's face and he studied him, watching him sob. George said, my beloved son was dead and there I was in the middle of an African jungle 8,000 miles away from home. I never felt more forsaken. After a few minutes, the old man got up and he ran off through the jungle screaming, the white man cries just like us. The white man cries just like us. George staggered home and he and Winifred sat alone in the dark, utterly broken. And they resolved to leave Ganta and never come back again. Suddenly there was a knock on their door. When they opened it, there stood the chief and every man and every woman and every child from the village. The chief said to him, the white man cries we will cry with him. You see, Bobby had grown up playing in the village with all the other little boys and little girls. The mono considered him their son too. 
Don't children have a funny way of bringing cultures together? Don't they have a funny way of bridging cultures and bringing people together? Do you suppose God knew that when he sent a child? Up until then, the villagers thought that the white man was somehow impervious to their pain. He treated thousands of sick people, but he himself never got sick. He had tools and potions and resources to protect him. The white man didn't share their problems. The white man didn't feel their pain. No matter how much pain his patients were in, he didn't cry while he was treating them. No matter how many died, he never cried. They thought that he was incapable of feeling their pain. In short, they felt that he was not one of them. Amano people sat outside all night and howled and wailed and cried with the missionary. When Sunday came, the chief and every man and every woman and every child in the village packed out that little chapel. And through his tears, George Harley told the Mono people about the God who cries just like us about the God who came from far away to help us, about the God whose only son was our son too, and whose son was buried in our soil. The light of the gospel came to Ganto, Liberia, and the Mono chief and every member of his village became believers in the God who cried with us. At present, we do not see everything subject to him yet, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God who cried with us, a great big praise in this place today. Oh, come on, let's give him a good praise.